Earlier, we talked about how waves can carry both energy and momentum. And in this particular section, we're going to talk about how this momentum can be transferred to other objects in the form of what we call radiation pressure. Now, it's very important to understand that under normal intensities, even under the intensity from the sun, the amount of pressure that we're talking about is very, very small. To put things in perspective, atmospheric pressure is about 10 to the fifth pascals. For solar radiation pressure, radiation coming from sunlight, it's more like in the micro uh, pascals. So comparing 10 to the fifth pascals from atmospheric pressure to 10 to the minus six pascals for radiation pressure shows you that this is not a very large amount of pressure that's produced. It is appreciable enough to actually cause something like a solar sail to accelerate to um, you know, a, a non-insignificant amount of uh, velocity. And we'll talk about this idea of a solar sail a little bit later. So let's talk about um, radiation pressure. Uh, radiation pressure was first observed in comets. And here we see a comet which has both a dust tail and a plasma tail. The plasma tail is that lighter tail uh, to the left. It's sort of bluish. And that represents plasma, which is being essentially trapped by the magnetic field lines of the sun. The dust, however, this dust trail, which is the, the brighter, the whiter trail, is actually bits of the comet which are being ripped off, dust really, and then uh, pushed by radiation pressure. Now, why is the dust pushed more than the comet itself? If we think about radiation pressure, radiation pressure is really a function. It's how many newtons per meter squared. So it's a function of the surface area. Whereas the mass of the object, the amount of inertia that it has, its resistance to changing motion goes by the uh, square, I'm sorry, the cube of the radius. So basically what happens here is for very, very light particles, they'll experience a larger acceleration for the radiation pressure than a larger body like the nucleus of the comet. And that's what gives us the comet tail. So to understand radiation pressure, we can really you know, think about it as almost like an elastic or inelastic collision. If we have light striking an absorptive object, such as a black disk, essentially the momentum from the light is going to be transferred to the black disk. And it's basically an inelastic collision. The momentum um, is uh, transferred and uh, basically the energy of the collision is lost. However, if we bounce light off of a reflective surface, not only do we have the impulse from the light making contact with the surface, we also have the light rebounding so we actually double the amount of momentum transfer. So in determining radiation pressure, uh, if it's an absorptive body, we have a certain amount of pressure that's produced. If it's a reflective body, we get twice as much momentum transfer because essentially, again, it's an inelastic collision versus an elastic collision. Now, once again, how do we understand radiation pressure? Well, the electromagnetic wave has an electric and magnetic field and these are going to interact with the electrons in whatever material they're hitting via what's known as the Lorentz force. And the Lorentz force takes into account the force from the electric field and the force from the magnetic field. However, this is really difficult to quantify because you're looking at the amount of electron density, the number of electrons per uh, surface area, which are absorbing or reflecting the electromagnetic waves and the mean velocity of electrons while they're on the surface. So really coming up with a number here based on this Lorentz force is really, really difficult. So we're gonna play a little game here. We're gonna do a dimensional analysis and we'll cheat. We know that if we look at this quantity U, now U is not energy, but rather the energy per unit volume, okay? It's the amount of joules we have per cubic uh, meter and that is the energy contained in an electromagnetic field. So taking joules per meter cubed, and then take, turning joules into newton meters, okay, 
we can cancel out the meters in the numerator with one of the meters in the denominator. And guess what we get? Newtons per meter squared. You should recognize that because that is the SI unit for pressure. Um, this doesn't prove that energy density is proportional to uh, pressure, but the unit analysis at least shows that there's a there's a bit of a connection here. So really, <clears throat> um, I won't uh, go through all the particulars. Um, energy density represents the momentum content in a beam of light. So for instance, let's say that we have some beam of light represented by the cylinder. Now, if we look at a section as shown in the, the yellow here, um, this section is a volume with surface area A and it has some length X. <clears throat> now, light travels at the speed of light. So X represents the speed of light times the time that it takes to traverse that. So we're going to take this energy density formula, U is equal to E over V, and we're going to convert that into something that is related to intensity. So first of all, volume is equal to area times length, or the area of the cylinder times the length of the cylinder. As we said before, this is area times the speed of light times delta T. So that is going to go in the denominator. The energy, now I had to use a different P here because uh, P can be pressure or power. The script P is for power. Power is equal to energy divided by time. So energy is power times time. But we also know power um, is related to intensity. Intensity is power divided by area. Okay. So the energy in this cylinder is represented by its intensity times its cross sectional area times the time at which the light traverses this part of the beam. So I'm going to put that in the numerator. So once again, energy density, how much energy I have per volume, is equal to IA delta T. The volume <clears throat> is equal to the area times C times delta T. And this simplifies. It says that the energy contained in any electromagnetic wave is equal to its intensity divided by the speed of light. And again, we did a little bit of hand waving. We said energy density is really the momentum of this because the units are the same. <clears throat> we really should go through a more sophisticated proof than that, but let's just accept that for now. And uh, essentially, the pressure from light pushing on something, the force divided by area, if it's absorbed, if it absorbs the electromagnetic wave, is I divided by C. It is the energy density of the of the uh, of the wave. If it reflects, then we get twice as much momentum. The momentum that is contained in the light, okay, and then it reverses direction, so that takes an additional impulse. So radiation pressure from a reflective body is actually equal to twice the intensity divided by C. Now, back to sunlight. Sunlight has very, very little radiation pressure. And the reason for this is, even though the intensity is quite high, about a kilowatt or a thousand watts per meter squared, a little bit more than that, the speed of light is a really large number. So we're dividing by 10 to the eight. Um, so again, that gives us a really small amount of pressure in micronewtons. Um, uh, you know, atmospheric pressure again, 10 to the fifth pascals. If we want to know how much radiation forces on a body, then that's equal to the radiation pressure times the surface area of the object, or I times A divided by C. Okay, so if there's complete radiation absorption, it's I times A divided by C. If it reflects, it's 2I A over C. If it's partial absorption, partial reflection, it's going to be somewhere between those. Now, again, going back to the comet, the dust particles are very, very small. They have very small amounts of mass. Even though their surface area is small, the uh, mass of these particles is comparably much smaller. So the force can be appreciable and accelerate them away from the comet and produce this beautiful tail. However, the comet nucleus itself doesn't experience 
as much force per mass. Force is proportional to the area, the surface area of the comet, <clears throat> where the mass is proportional to the volume. And, and we know as we make something larger and larger, the volume gets bigger than the area. So again, um, what we need for the radiation force to be significant is we need a really large surface area, okay? And a very low mass. And that's the concept behind this solar sail. Um, this was, again, first envisioned by uh, you know, several people before it was actually tested. And uh, the concept was you could take a very thin reflective material like aluminized mylar, um, very low mass, but create a huge surface area, a huge reflective surface area, and uh, therefore have a significant influence from the radiation pressure from the sun. Again, all kinds of applications have been thought out for this. Um, one is to create a solar sail to accelerate a space probe to nearby stars. Um, you know, at first it would accelerate from the, the radiation pressure from the sun. Then the idea was to shine a laser on it to uh, continue to illuminate it long after the, uh, the sun's intensity was too small to really affect it very much. Um, in this case, light sail one was actually using the radiation pressure from the sun to deorbit the solar sail. So they put an orb and they tried to see how quickly they could deorbit it. And the other application is to um, actually change the trajectory for asteroids. So again, <clears throat> it's not a very significant amount of pressure, but if we have a very light material like this aluminized mylar, and we can perhaps make uh, you know, a very large, you know, light sail, you know, maybe one kilometer by one kilometer, that's a newton of force, which, you know, if you keep one newton of force, even on, you know, a, a pretty significant mass, if it's accelerating for years, you can reach a very, very high speed. Okay. So again, radiation pressure. Um, I apologize that I jumped from energy density to, to uh, you know, pressure without really showing very much there. But um, again, if we think about it, all waves carry with them energy and momentum, okay? If something absorbs the electromagnetic waves, it's going to absorb the momentum that the light had, okay? If the light bounces off of it, you're going from positive momentum to negative momentum, you're creating an even larger impulse and uh, that's why these reflective sails are going to be much more effective at accelerating a small body.